Good evening, and welcome to Monkeys with Fire. How is everybody tonight? I hope you're all well. So, of course, tonight we have another Table Talk interview, and tonight's interview is with the founder of River Horse Games, Alessio Cavatore. Now, Alessio is renowned for co-designing some of the biggest games in the industry. We're talking Warhammer, we're talking Warhammer 40k, and we're also talking the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game. And in addition to those, of course, we've got many titles that Riverhorse Games have launched over the past couple of years, some of which you have seen actually on the channel. So... I can't wait for this interview. I've got loads of questions. Um, this is going to be a real blast. And good evening, Alessio. Good evening. Hi. Welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, very welcome. So um, we've got quite a, a packed evening tonight as far as what you potentially could be telling us. <laughs> um, because if we may, we'd like to maybe learn a little bit about your history as a designer, uh, some of the sure. games that you've worked on in the past, maybe get a bit of an understanding of where some of your inspirations have, have come from. And then, of course, to move on to River Horse Games, talking about the titles that the... Uh, company has launched and then moving on to what is going to be your latest title which is crowdfunder yes absolutely i mean it's uh <laughs> it's a lot to talk about but yes it's um it's uh crowdfunder is definitely what we are getting for at the moment and in fact we have here caesar our resident artist who is uh, gonna draw something while we speak right so I believe you want to announce the plan, or shall I? Well, well, by all means, you go for it, yes. Please do. <laughs> okay. So Caesar will actually uh, draw a, a card for Monkeys with Fire. <laughs> and uh, basically, we can zoom in on his uh, on, on his desk there, where he's, uh, he's working. And uh, as well, we will we'll see that in progress. And uh, if you guys then feel like want to do any suggestions or let us know anything about comments, so they'll, <laughs> we'll react live. Uh, there's also a few miniatures that will probably zoom past, zoom past the, the camera, but yeah, that's not, that's not the main point. Okay. Excellent, this sounds good. So there we go, guys. Um, as Caesar is, is drawing this illustration, if you have any ideas, things that sort of sum up the Monkeys With Fire channel for you, um little sort of uh, idiosyncrasies of maybe the uh, the broadcaster i don't know you may have noticed a few over the many months that we've been streaming uh please do put them in the chat and also uh, any questions that you've have for alessio again please put them in the chat and i will of course relay them on <laughs> if they're polite <laughs> <laughs> oh this, this is a very nice chat yeah they 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 are very nice to our guests on here don't worry don't worry <laughs> Okay, so what I thought we would maybe start off with then is just get a little bit of background on yourself as far as as sort of growing up, what your sort of exposure to games were, what type of games you enjoyed, what sure. sort of um, books you read, TV, the inspiration that, of course, has paved the way for the creations you've done later in life. Sure. Yeah, basically, as uh, I grew up in Italy, uh, I was born in 1972, so I'm quite old now. But when I when I was born there, um, the first I think the first contact with the fantasy the fantasy world was through Tolkien, uh, Lord of the Rings, the cartoon that is, um, the Ralph Bakshi one. I don't know if any, <laughs> it's still that uh, well known. But so it started with that. It started with films like Excalibur it, it, and. The, the the fantasy genre was uh, introduced to us. We read it at school, in fact, as part of literature. And from that, the first the first move into the gaming world was uh, role play games. It was Dungeons and Dragons. It started with that and a couple of local but German Italian uh, RPGs, Catacumbas, uh, uh, and then the German one, uh, which I can't pronounce the name. It translates as uh, a gaze in the dark, but I'm not sure. That. <laughs> um, anyway, so role play games were where it started. I played that quite a lot, D and D, AD and D, advanced D and D for for quite a while, and. I was doing that, and that was my geek 
kind of spirit, satisfied by RPGs and thinking, oh God, I would really like to write this stuff for a, for a living. It would be a dream. You know, it would be oh, fantastic. I wonder, you know, the people that you know write this stuff, uh, they make a living out of it. Fantastic, and th that should be a great career. But we always thought of it as a as a pipe dream, you know, something like, yeah, yeah, well, it's not going to be real, is it? Um, and then I found some books that um, they are called the battle game books. Uh, um, and basically, imagine a, for example, one themed on uh, medieval knights, where you have lots of cool, cool artwork and information about the crusades and the world of uh, feudal knights and everything. So and at the end of the book, there's, uh, there's four double page spreads which are actually hexes or squares games and then some some pages where you can photocopy uh little squares and put them on the board and maybe start playing those as, uh, as little war games board games and uh, from that i went into also avon hill type board games hexes and hexes and cardboard counters so yeah that was you know ancient history uh also toy soldiers toy soldiers i think is the funniest thing i had lots and lots of little plastic h ho scale you know 20 20 mil scale models and i used to have a bedroom uh, which had a parquet motif it was like uh, squares on the floor of my bedroom uh, when, when i was a kid teenager and um I used to play battles with the toy soldiers on that floor with uh, rules that kind of the I, I wrote the adapted if you want from the rules from those books so it started Merry like that Christmas and uh, ho, ho. I remember huge armies on the floor there and the, the desperation of my mum was, was like uh, we cannot clean this room is a mess <laughs> but the house cat was happy was destroying whole armies uh, so yeah that was fun so yeah that's how it started really the, the very very ancient beginning of it <laughs> that was uh, that was the if you want the preamble and then the, the career side of things started with me breaking my leg and uh, therefore having to give up kendo which was my main activity i was doing a lot of kendo uh, you know japanese fencing armor yeah, yeah, yeah. sword yeah that's something that i was doing a lot of and break my leg seriously not doing kendo doing something stupid like laser tagging and uh, Therefore, having a lot of time in my hands, and uh, I go to a club, a role-play club in Italy, and I see these people playing with metal painted toy soldiers uh, in a, I think it was Skaven versus Empire. And I was like, ooh, what's that? Because until now I used miniatures just for RPG, and suddenly I see this game which is about battles, huge battles with, uh, with miniatures, and that was Warhammer, my first exposure to Warhammer, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, I think it was, oh, let me think, 4th edition Warhammer. Oh, uh, nice. And yeah, and uh, all this was in English, uh, so we had to learn a lot of English for role-play games, for, uh, for, because there was no Italian edition, so you know, uh, a lot of my English came from, um, from reading RPG and uh, and war game manuals and later maybe reading books. So, you know, um, eventually I went. Oh, I must read Lord of the Rings in English, not the translated version. So yeah, Warhammer. And Warhammer became an obsession. Uh, I did a lot of planning army lists at university instead of reading or studying the books. I was supposed to literally. <laughs> I remember. I remember in the in the library having. You know, big tome of biochemistry, and on top of it, uh, you know, an army list and kind of going Max Kevin army list and spending too much time going, ooh, I wonder if I should add, you know, one regiment of Skaven slaves or this or that or, uh, for hours and hours and hours. And that led to the career. The, the obsession with Warhammer led to playing and winning the Italian Warhammer tournament in 1990. Five, I believe, in the four, ninety-five, uh, which you know, it was a small affair at the time. Of course, uh, we're not talking about hundreds of people; it's more like a couple of dozen people. But you know, it was a moment of glory and a moment that, uh, more importantly, uh, made me come to the attention of uh, some of the people that were opening uh, Games Workshop Italy at the time. They were opening a, an Italian branch based in Nottingham uh, for translating the, the Warhammer manuals and products into into Italian. And as I win the tournament, I meet uh, the guys that were founding the King's Worship Italy and uh, I get offered a job and I come over to, to Nottingham. <laughs> 1996, something like that. 
and I started working as a translator in Games Workshop, uh, so, translating. So can, I, can I just ask, how old were you at that time then? Uh, ooh, uh, 96, uh, so 72 to 24. Okay. <laughs> so I basically, I was in the middle, uh, towards the end of my university studies, and I froze them and said to my parents uh, that were financing my studies uh, kindly. I went, uh, bye, I'm going to England to work <laughs> in the in the gaming industry. And they were like... <laughs> 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 yeah, they were like, you're doing what? Uh, but um, yeah, so that was a moment of choice, a moment of, you know, where your life goes into a completely different direction. Came over, started to uh, translate Warhammer uh, into 4th edition, 5th edition into Italian. Uh, and the interesting thing was being in the studio, uh, being in the Games Workshop studio, being in contact with you know people like Rick Priestley, who was uh, the, the leader of the studio at the time, the manager of the studio, uh, having colleagues like Jervis Johnson, you know, people that, I mean, I learned so much from these people. And I have to say, about game design, but also about just being a nice person. <laughs> I think for, from, you know, I, I have a great respect for those people. Uh, so yeah, uh, a year, few years of translating stuff, and uh, actually about a year of translating stuff and uh, playing in staff tournaments, uh, uh, of which I won two in a row. <laughs> Some people didn't like me very much because I <clears throat> was a bit hard, I think. Uh, <laughs> I was a bit of a power player, I admit. <laughs> you, you were there uh, to win. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was the people that were telling me, well, you should play for fun. You shouldn't, you know, be sorry. And I was like, yeah, fun is of course crushing your enemies and drive them before you and listen to the lamentation of the women right that's fun <laughs> <laughs> yes i didn't quite uh, see the uh, maybe more relaxed angle of what the war games can be um but then the perry twins you know great sculptors and friend of a great friend of mine have uh, friends of mine have uh, taught me the nice and mellow side of playing for fun. So I, <laughs> now in my old age, I prefer playing for fun. I'm, I'm just, uh, I've lost the eye of the tiger. So the tournaments are, <laughs> I lose all the time. <laughs> so yeah, um, the career went on from, you know, as I said, about a year of translation. And then I was annoying all the designers there, you know, Gavin Thorpe, Thomas Pirin and Andy Chambers. I was constantly annoying them about their, uh, the, the product they were doing because I was translating them so I was going oh but I was translating this rule do you mean this or do you mean that oh and I, so basically I got involved with the old designing of it and uh, then eventually there was a position of games developer up there and uh, I applied and got it and so I moved from the Italian business to the main studio as a game designer uh, starting with Warhammer so first book was well, first I did some work on the Dogs of War and then the Vampire Counts. The first time they were split, the Undead were split into Vampire Counts and Tomb Kings. So I started to do armies for Warhammer uh, for a long time. I did quite a few books. I mean, um, Skaven always been my kind of my favorite. Uh, this some very broken Skaven, I'm told. Um, a bit too good, perhaps. <laughs> or so they, so they say. Um, and uh, eventually I was given the, um, when we did the Lord of the Rings, when Games Workshop did the Lord of the Rings game system, uh, and Rick Priestley and I wrote it, I mean, Rick wrote the core of it, and then he handed it over to me uh, to finish it off and uh, keep it uh, going and develop it further. So the, 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 I got in charge, if you want, of the, I got handed the, the Lord of the Rings system as my first big responsibility. That did well. Uh, it was a great time. I mean, being in the movie of Lord of the Rings was a mystic experience for me because Tolkien is the closest I have to to, a, to a religion, I guess, in my life. <laughs> so uh, I've got to just pause you there for one second because for anybody who has not checked out your Twitter page, <laughs> which was a, a real surprise to me when I went on, can you just explain, you know, just because you've just dropped a, a bombshell here, you were in <laughs> The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, am, uh, I have a very important role in uh, The Return of the King. I play a dead rider of Rohan that appears on screen for about t three seconds, maybe? <laughs> so yeah, it was it was a fantastic adventure. It was 
fantastic. Uh, I, basically, myself, uh, the Perry Twins, Brian Nelson, uh, Gary Morley, we went to the to the set. We went to New Zealand, uh, met Peter Jackson, met Richard Taylor, the the boss of Weta Workshops, and basically it was a mission to uh, acquire knowledge and learn about the the new film, The Return of the King, because we were designing the all the different. Uh, you know, this was between the two towers and the Return of the King coming out to the cinema and our games with them. So we went there to have a, you know, fact-finding mission. But it was fantastic. We, the people there were so nice to us. They they, they, they brought us on set. We watched the, the film as it was filmed, I was sitting behind Peter Jackson as he was directing. We, we went to see all the props, all the labs. They were doing all the costumes and special effects. We we even were at their, their homes. They invited the home and showed us some of the collections and stuff they have, which is astonishing but basically particularly the Perry twins became really good friend with Peter Jackson and uh, I um, I benefited from being you know in this group of people that uh, and you know I did offer a little suggestion at the time I remember uh, uh, to, to Peter Jackson about naming one of the characters in the film which was great it was my moment of glory <laughs> and um, and then he said well, would you like to be in the film and but like Yes, <laughs> is the trick question. Yes, we would. So we had this little cameo where we dress up as Riders of Rohan, and if you go on my Facebook page, in particular, there's some pictures of that period and uh, you know the time in Middle Earth. And yeah, we were in the movie, and uh, you know, as as Pippin um, is looking for Mary on the fields of Pelennor, and finally finds his uh, his elven cloak on the floor, and as his foot comes to the elven cloak, he kind of. He actually kicked my head quite a few times because he had these big hobbit feet, and uh, so I was dead next to the <laughs> next to the all, all the four of us are dead, lying there covered in blood and arrows, and uh, and uh, basically we. I mean, in my case in particular, I, I was a problem for the crew because I kept smiling. <laughs> I kept going, oh my god, I'm in love with the rings. So you have this <laughs> guy, this guy that's been mauled by orcs and Mumakil, and yeah, because they're lying there with an expression like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I was too, I, I was going to Valhalla probably at the time, and uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was it was astonishing, and uh, it was a great experience. I mean, meeting all of the cast, and I have you know, I have a booklet with all dedications and bus autographs and stuff and it was a great experience and i can still watch myself in, in the return of the king which is which is cool <laughs> that's brilliant that's really really cool and so and you actually can freeze frame and you can point yourself out and you, yeah oh yeah excellent. oh yeah yeah, yeah. Excellent. as i said if you go to facebook there's a lot of the freeze framing <laughs> i might have uh, screen grabbed a few of those features obviously <laughs> moment of glory yes yeah, it's, it's an important part it's super important. sarah's saying that the crew yells out Get dead guy number six. Please stop smiling. <laughs> stop smiling, yes. <laughs> it did happen quite a few times. Yes. Okay, so now, and just, I remember collecting the um, strategy battle games for Middle Earth at the time that it was launched. So, because um, I, I think they did a magazine version of it, so I collected a, a huge amount of yep. those minis there. Yeah, um, apart which, I, I, sh I should ask you, uh, so... As much as you playing the games at an early age, did you actually sit down and paint any of your miniatures? <laughs> uh, two. Okay. <laughs> as in, I started painting first historical stuff. A 20 mil Highlander with a backpipe was my first ever. So I was like magnifying glass, tiny one single, you know, tiny, the smallest paintbrush you can imagine, trying to paint tartan on a kilt of a 20 mil figure. And that kind of put me off painting for, <laughs> I was like, this is so difficult, it's impossible. So I left it. Then later when, when Warhammer came about, I did start my Skaven. I painted a whole Doom Wheel, all the bits. Uh, and then I painted a couple of Plague Monks, a Sensor Bearer and then put down my brush and never picked up a brush ever again in my life. Nice. I, I basically, I, I own a lot of armies, but I always had them painted on commission for myself. I, I, I love the gaming side. I love the, the playing of the game. I love I just, you know, instinct of collecting all the armies, etc., planning the armies, even putting them together. But is the painting that I always, uh, I always wanted other people to do for me because I always felt like 
oh, I'm doing this, but I'd rather play that game or read that book or watch that movie. So I always had other things I wanted to do with my time. So I guess like that means that I don't like painting <laughs> very much. Well, I mean, again, this is the great thing about the hobby, isn't it? Is that you can come at it from many, many different angles. Uh, and sometimes you you, you do all of them. <laughs> so, okay, yes, you so could say that I'm not a complete hobbyist, indeed. I am a gamer, first and foremost. Okay. okay. So uh, do it, you've worked on, then, the, the Lord of the Rings. What, what happened after that, then? Well, after Lord of the Rings, then, uh, because that went well, uh, they gave me more trust and uh, gave me uh, gave me the uh, another edition of Warhammer uh, so I don't remember was it six seven <laughs> I've lost lost track but it, there's an edition of Warhammer where basically I was in charge of the project I took I, I had the privilege of uh, developing it and uh, uh, give it my own spin on the rules side you know because again my aspiration is the aspiration of every designer is to try to improve the system that, that's the instinct isn't it it's like oh we could best make it better by doing this thing so you champion a few changes to the rules so i did that with warhammer at one edition i think is seventh but i'll keep double check <laughs> it's been so long uh and then uh, that went well and therefore a few years later they gave me 40k and again it was a big thing big thing to do fifth edition if i remember correctly uh so i did the 40k main rule book again developed the bringing the, the the rules in a direction that i liked and then of course after the rule books you kind of make sure that all the army books that follow more or less you know match with the rules you've written so you become effectively like a system had rules in terms of rules uh, and uh and that was i suppose my peak uh, the peak of my career against Warship, where uh, yes, I basically all three main rule books of the three main systems were well, it's your Kavatar, which <laughs> you know it was uh, you know when you're a little kid playing Warhammer in Italy, etc., and you think, oh, maybe if somebody you know can get a job of doing this, thinking of that, it was a great achievement, and I'm very proud of it, and it was great, it's a good thing. So again, okay. So you're, you're, you've got this, this system and you've been given the ch charge of it. Is there any sort of particular rule that you created that caused controversy within the fan base? Uh, either for, for it being incredibly positive or, or negative? Oh. <laughs> well, I, just off the top of my head, uh, without thinking too hard, because I mean, there, there was a lot of, you know, when you do design lots of rules, there's always people that like something you do, something that people that hate something you do. I suppose one thing that I, two things really I championed a lot, and I tried to put them in all the, in all the the systems I work on, uh, in Games Worship and after Games Worship, uh, is that I was quite radical. I am quite radical in trying to cut down on rules to make them. To just cut the number of rules and shorten them, and uh, but uh, there was a big. I tried to push really hard towards uh, cutting things, making them simpler, and other people thought that was too. I was going too far, and therefore there was a you know like always when you work as a team, you have to take on board feedback, and uh, you know senior designers would uh, uh, influence your decisions. But I think. Radical simplicity was one thing, uh, and you know some people like it, some people don't. Uh, the other thing, possibly more a simpler, a simpler example of something more specific is uh, a real line of sight. I remember uh, thinking that line of sight in a war game can be done top down. You know, you're looking at pieces of terrain from the top down and going right. If the line goes through this piece of terrain, then you see, then you don't see, and those are possibly neater but i again in the 40k edition that i that i was in charge of i went i introduced quite a lot of uh, real line of sight and by which i mean the the moment when you go behind the miniature and look through you know along the barrel of the gun that is being fired yeah yeah because that is in a way is incredibly simple because it's obvious you just see and either you have a clear shot or you have or you cannot see the target simple or it's a bit obscured in which case you will go for armor say modifiers to hit but basically it's the not quite clear shot so you kind of have three possible solutions uh, i think in principle that is great and works well 
and more importantly, has the thing that it brings you into the action. That was the thing I, th that's the reason why I accepted this less clean system, perhaps less gamey, less board gamey. But if the fact that it brings you into the action means that you can, you are there, you are the guy, you're the guy that is firing the gun you're into the action you're looking at it from this angle as opposed to from the top like that which i think it makes the experience better uh, better from my point of view it makes it uh, more i don't know immersive um and that was a big thing at the time it was a big thing because obviously uh, more abstract systems can be probably cleaner that is the problem with that the main problem with that is terrain because when we play test things in companies, we have a certain type of terrain, normally quite a lot of terrain, which is the quality of terrain. So that looking through the gun and seeing cover, etc., it's great. However, in reality, in clubs at home, people often just put down a piece of paper or a flat thing and say, this is a wood, this is a, and there's nothing blocking the line of sight, of course. So by looking down, you can see anything and shoot anything. So is the, to, to a degree, it works really well on a great table. It doesn't work as well on a uh, simpler table, uh, less expensive, less, you know, something that we, we would have at home as opposed to what, you know, Games Workshop has in their studios. So uh, that, I think, was the problem, is the, uh, you do need a bit more abstract rules to allow people to use their collections of terrain, which normally are not as good as, as the designers. Mm -hmm. So that. Okay. Uh, I mean, certainly because I think I am sort of typical as sort of most sort of gamers is that I used to play my Games Workshop games as a sort of, a, you know, older child, sort of early teen. And then you sort of drop out because you're possibly doing your studying or you've maybe discovered beer and girls. Uh, girls, yeah. <laughs> and, and then you come back to it uh, as a, you know, as a, when you've, you've got your first sort of couple of jobs under your belt and you've got a bit more disposable income, yeah. Uh, but the one thing that I sort of noticed, and certainly more recently now, is how skirmish-based games have massively taken off. So it's not a case of having to have huge armies, which was where I sort of started with, with my Warhammer and my 40k. And uh, just looking at some of your background, you worked on Mordheim. Yes, Mordheim, Warmaster, yeah, quite a lot of other games. And yes, Mordheim, I worked with Thomas Pirinen on that. Uh, I remember playtesting some of those warbands, the Skaven warband in particular, of course. Um, yes, uh, Necromunda, Mordheim certainly have a... Or even Blood Bowl. I mean, obviously that's more of a board game with miniatures. But yeah, uh, certainly keeping things a bit smaller definitely is a, a trend for the industry, indeed. Okay. Um, Snowy Axe asking, so, and, and this probably leads us on nicely, uh, at what moment did you decide to start your own company? Well, after doing the three uh, game systems, obviously, uh, you can reach uh, that uh, the rubber ceiling, if you want, as they say, is the moment where you go, where do I go next? So, obviously, the where do I go next eventually... <laughs> <laughs> was out <laughs> so the uh the adventure ended in 2010 uh i was 15 years yeah 15 years of uh, of, of games workshop which you know is the where i learned my trade uh and then uh, yeah my, basically when when that ended uh, there was a case of basically finding another job in other companies, there were a few options, but a friend of mine is a serial entrepreneur and he just went, why don't you start your own business? I was like, huh, didn't think of that. <laughs> and uh, so with him, we, we started this company. Uh, we made a, well, I mean, the plan was to create games because obviously I had games that I wanted to do in my head for years. Uh, so the, the plan was to start doing games. So River Horse was born as let's make my own games and bring them design them bring it to the market sell them uh and like all startups like all small companies you maybe start with one thing in mind and then the market dictates where you go basically where there is cash <laughs> which at the beginning was definitely not in making our own games at the beginning it was uh, because of as i said when i came out of games workshop quite a few other companies around started to go oh could you you know um, work with us on this this and that and uh, and basically instead of becoming an employee of them i approached it as well you can hire river horse 
as a consultancy, as a you know, as a contract to you know work with you on these things or do them for you or you know various types of contracts, and that's how Bolt Action was born, and that's how Kings of War was born, and uh, there was Volt and uh, All Quiet on the Martial Front. There were you know a, a number of these. I mean, even uh, I remember being contacted by Fantasy Flight, uh, <laughs> like, oh, would you like to do some work on uh, on Dust Warfare? I was like. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, you know, it was um, it was basically a reverse ended up almost as a studio for hire, where me and some other people that I knew that worked uh, on the in the industry could uh, lend our uh, skills to to various other companies that were in the industry. And uh, uh, I think the, the most successful of all those collaborations is Bolt Action to this day. Yes, I think yes. is is growing into a really big game, and I'm really proud of that because it's a, it's really, it's very close to what I well, it is what I would design as a war game for myself. Uh, in a way, is the, uh, the if you look at how simple a lot of the elements of it are, it, it is that. I mean, I give you an example: the rules for running away. You know the. You know, in war gaming, you have this. Ooh, well, so when you are fleeing, a unit or a model flees away from what? Oh, to away from the thing that caused it to flee, away or close a stable edge. And and there are some cases where this works, and some cases where it makes no sense. Where you go away from the things that just shot at you. Yes, but I'm running towards this giant monster that is about to eat me, uh, or away towards the table. But there's a giant monster in the way. <laughs> I wouldn't run in that direction. So you have to start to write caveats and stuff about, and it becomes complicated and sometimes yeah difficult. So I mean, my solution to all of that was, is a six-turn game. You, your squad, your unit, your model runs away. How is that resolved? Basically, fails the morale test, is removed. He's taken away from the table. So again, very radical. Some people may like it, some people may not. Um, so yeah, sorry, back to River Ross. I got distracted into, into the rules. So you were asking um, how we came to where we are today. Uh, well, so, well, 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 first of all, can it, one question. Where did the name come from? <laughs> Ah, yes. Yes, River Horse. Um, there's, a, there's a hippo, a knight on a hippo. The hippo has always been the uh, the symbol, and River Horse, I mean, uh, for people that, that haven't studied Greek, uh, hippopotamus uh, in Greek, in ancient Greek, means uh, river horse. Hippos is a, is a horse, and potamus is a river. So, River Horse. Um, and the reason why I chose the hippo as the totem animal is that, um, well, uh, another little aside, my wife is Japanese. I go to Japan quite often. Uh, when it came to write my name with Japanese characters, so writing Kavatore with Japanese characters, the first two characters you use for Kava, Kaba, Kava, which was my nickname as well, Kaba, Kaba, um, spell the, the, the two letters Kaba are mean hippopotamus in Japanese. Right. <laughs> and when I looked at those characters, I saw that because I was studying a bit the written Japanese. Uh, I recognize the, the, the river symbol, because it's a very simple, uh, you know, wavy line symbol. I went, wait a second, this hippopotamus thing has the river in it, in, in the Japanese complicated character. There's this bit of river. And what is the other bit that make this hippopotamus symbol? And I went, oh, that, that's that horse. I was like, what? are you telling me that in Japanese? So obviously from Chinese, ancient Chinese, and then probably Indian Sanskrit. Uh, River horse always meant hippopotamus. People all over the world called hippopotami river horses, and uh, yes, so you know, from the Greeks to the to the ancient Indians, Chinese. So, so that was fascinating, and it means me. And if you're Japanese, you get the joke that uh, Kavatore Kavatore is hippopotamus, hippopotamus hunter kind of. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a complicated reason why the company is called River Horse. That's amazing. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's fun. Uh, but yes, so that was River Horse Phase 1, where basically we started with Shuro, uh, I don't know if you can see Shuro, but it's a little you know chess variant. Uh, it's chess meets wargaming. That was the first concept that we brought to market. But again, they never became huge, big enough to sustain a company. Uh, and the, the, the Phase 1 was this hiring services to other companies, which we still do, but it has now become secondary. Now the first 
the, the primary thing we do in this phase two of River Horse, if you want, is uh, we make our own games. So you went back to the ori original plan. So we make games, we produce them, and we bring them to, when we design them, we bring them to market and sell them in, in all over the world, which is well, quite a game. And it's something that I'm really proud of because we have had a company that sells stuff from the US, Canada, South America, Japan, and, you know, all over Europe and uh, in, in, in Australia. It's something that you go, wow, <laughs> I made that. Yeah. I created this thing, which is, which is cool. Uh, so, second phase, our own games. And it all started, I think, the main thing when it started was this. Um, uh, Caesar, <laughs> may I just may I, sorry interrupt you a second? Could you show the little miniature that uh, is a good example of where it all started? I think I don't know how clear you guys can see that. Can you see him? That looks like Arnie. That is Arnie. That is from our Terminator game based on Genesis. So that's where we actually got a license to make uh, a war game based on uh, Gen Terminator Genesis, basically based on the war against the machines. Because I always, you know, watching the Terminator movies, I always went for the five minutes where there's this big fight between the, you know, in the future between the machines and, and the resistance. And uh, I went, well, I want to make a game about that war. So we created that, we got the license, and uh, we produced it together with Warlord Games. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, uh, the first step into the world of licensing. And uh, and it opened doors, and suddenly we knew how the process worked, and we started repeating it, and uh, basically acquired our licenses. And then, uh, my carefully prepared thing, then this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I must. This. I must admit that that is the game that put River Horse on the map for me. Yeah. Uh, that, this is the this is the thing that turned us turned turned around the company. It, it was a massive step change. You know, is this grew us? And it, I mean, it's still so hot. We cannot keep this in stock. <laughs> we keep making it, and it keeps disappearing from the shelves, which is you know it's a great problem to have, and. You know, this again was born out of my love. Labyrinth is a film that, you know, when I was growing up, it really, really informed my love for the whole, for the whole uh, genre, for the old fantasy genre and the music. I mean, and so this was the, the thing that changed the company, the size of the company, the scope of the company, and again, out out of that success. Then Dark Crystal, then other products with Labyrinth. There's more handsome stuff we are doing that you know we haven't announced yet. And then, oh, what's that thing? Oh, that something looks, is going on there. Oh. That looks like, a, <laughs> is that one of the characters out of the labyrinth? Is it, is it the fire goblins? Am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Fire goblins called Fireys, indeed. Fireys, that's it. And, uh, and yes, the, those are uh, upcoming new models, which will, is one of the expansions that is coming out for. Uh, I don't think we ever shown these on live, have we? <laughs> Ooh, Ooh, so Super little... Sarah is saying she wants to paint them all. <laughs> so you've got one fan, definitely. <laughs> Super Sarah, is that a labyrinth name? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so that was a big thing. And it led to another thing that is proving quite big for us, which is that. So suddenly another thing came about, so came about, which was a role-play game. So we've done board games, we've done miniatures games, and now <clears throat> a, a, a role-play game. Again, I always wanted to do my own system, and because I had a young daughter at the time, she was watching My Little Pony, and uh, I absolutely love the series. And we approached Hasbro, and uh, we said, could we make a, you know, a game, like a role-play game, like the Dungeons and Dragons that you kind of own, but we like to do it on My Little Pony. And uh, they said, yes, we had a go. And again, it's, it's a great game, well received, well loved, and uh, we're still you know, developing it. And uh, it's very exciting. It's again, it brought together the love for sharing something with my daughter to the love, the geek love. And it's certainly a very good reaching product to teach your kids about role play. And, you know, yes. moving from that into D&D maybe later when they, when they grow up a bit. So, yeah, those were the two big things i think for for river horse uh new products so yes my kind of system here shows us <laughs> <laughs> example um this is a uh, one of the expansion books one of the adventures modules that yeah. we produce 
original artwork, story, uh, some of it by Caesar himself, and uh, he, he likes to put eyes on uh, on monsters to make them look cute and cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> yes, he's just like, I put cute and cuddly eyes on this shark, for example. I remember this expression, <laughs> which was quite funny. Um, but anyway, so those are the two main things really for, for us. But on the other hand, we also have gone into lots of other licensing, uh, other products. And, you know, the criteria to choose the license pretty much is things that I love <laughs> tends to be <laughs> tends to be the, the point. It, things that I really like, stories that I really love. Uh, so, you know, we had Highlander, which for me always meant a lot. The, the movie, that music, Queen's music for me is, you know, always been great and Again, we made a game on Highlander, which I'm chuffed to go, right, I made a game about Highlander. This is, you know, one of my favorite movies. And uh, The Hunger Games. I really love the books, love the movies. Uh, and again, we got to make a game on The Hunger Games, which is like, wow. And of course, recently, Pacific Rim. So, you know, the first Pacific Rim is a film that the game recently, I just, you know, I kept watching and watching and watching the the music, the sound effects, they did, the, the size of the things. They did. I think... It captured the old giant robots fighting better than any other movie because of the slowness of it, how cumbersome and huge they are, and slow and heavy. They don't move fast. I think fast and giant robots don't go together very well. Shall I share this with you guys? Let's bring Iha electricity. <laughs> Let's bring a couple of these fellas under that camera. Oh, wow, these look amazing. Yep, these are the tests that have been done and uh, basically the the factories are now busy painting loads and loads and loads of these that uh, really nice I, I must i must say because i i've uh, had the pleasure of playing several of river horses games over the past uh, couple of months uh, specifically the dark crystal and highlander and it's very interesting to hear you say that you've chosen licenses because you love the property personally. As a consumer, and as I've opened up those boxes, I can see the love that has gone on into making the game, that it's absolutely a it's a, a love letter to the fans of that particular property. Um, oh, oh, stop now, we're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> There are so many licensed games out in the industry where you can t kind of see where the the, the, uh, the publishers grab the license and just stuck on some photographs and there we go, it sells. But it, it seems to be a very different mindset from River Horse. I mean, it, it, am, am I right in saying that? I, well, I would love to think that because, again, as I said, <laughs> I choose things. I choose things that I really, really love. I mean, and uh, I obviously try to bring justice to the to the to the ip i mean i remember going through the labyrinth and picking all the scenes making all the quotes for the right thing so making sure that, that the player would feel like they're playing through the entire movie and and i know what you, what you say about the sometimes licensed games are done in a, in a you know just you know maybe too quickly and therefore not developed well enough and it's funny enough because i have seen quite a couple of reviews on uh, things like labyrinth where people have gone oh yeah but it's just another licensed game so you know th th there's like an assumption that licensed games have to be bad games and actually i've seen a couple of reviews of labyrinth when the, you read the review and you go you have not played it have you <laughs> things that i like in the case of my little pony the IP of that uh, of that series. I don't know if you've ever seen a series again that has the same prejudice. There's a lot of people that think, oh, it's you know, it's for kids. It's not interesting. It's just then nah, no, I was. But actually, and again, maybe that's what I felt before because again, I remember the old series. I didn't. It's easy to just dispatch these things without actually looking at them. And, and again, I looked at my little pony. I watched a few episodes with my daughter, and suddenly, you know, first episode, there's a manticore, they are in a forest, there's wizards, there's castles, there's spells, uh, there's dragons, and I go, wow! <laughs> and the characters are very likable, the, the, I think the the philosophy of the of the whole uh, program is very wholesome, it's, very, it's about friendship, it's about resolving conflict through friendship, and all the bad guys in the end turn around and become good guys, because they're not thought they are kind of they maybe thought initially but then they are turned to 
that talked to and listened to and uh, so it's it's a great philosophy it's a great philosophy and uh, we try to instill that into the game we try to make the game about making friends and being nice to each other and and, and to the people you meet and to the creatures you meet so it's all about friendship because friendship friendship is magic <laughs> well, well, I, I think somebody in the chat was saying uh that really we should have a Care Bears RPG and then their day will be made. <laughs> <laughs> could make a, a mod for Tales of Equestria. <laughs> Care Bears. <laughs> but I, I mean, certainly, when, I, as I say, when I opened up the copy of The Dark Crystal, I mean, first of all, looking at the miniatures, and I believe that there's a good story about how these miniatures have been created. Is it connected to the Weta workshops? Yes, I mean, uh, I can, that's, if you want to share one of these, uh, it's not dark behind, we have, we have some dark crystals there as well, if you want to bring, but, um, yes, uh, yes, the, uh, the artist that uh, created uh, the miniatures, sculpted the miniatures, and uh, the, what you're looking at is a Ludo at actual, the actual size has been sculpted at, which uh, then we shrunk three times uh, the size into the into the, game, the the miniatures for the game. But also we sell as a <laughs> at that size as well in a in a gold version. Please go to our website and buy it. <laughs> uh, but yes, the um, the guy that uh, did the uh, the miniatures and the artwork and the artwork for our games uh, is called Johnny Fraser Allen. He works at Weta Workshop and uh, is. Uh, we got to know Johnny through uh, the Perry Twins. We knew him, and uh, they told him about the Labyrinth license and the fact we were doing a game, and Johnny went, oh my God, it must be me. <laughs> I want to do it, because he loves the IP as well. Right. And obviously, so having such a talented person that has so much enthusiasm for uh, for the subject matter, it shows in the artwork, it shows in the in, in the in the, in the artwork and in the miniatures. I think they're, you know, they're very good. And again, the, we are learning for process that, you know, you see that our measures are getting better in terms of quality. Of course, you, know, you learn, you develop things. And so, yes. No, I mean, certainly that was, as I say, what I recognized straight away with the game on the original artwork, the attention to detail on the miniatures, uh, even the fact that the actual inlay tray was well thought out and had a nice sort of velour feel to it. It's it's a game for the fans of the Dark Crystal, you know, it, it, absolutely. And of course, Dark Crystal is going to have a prequel coming out potentially next year, so it's going to be a it's very uh, very timely, isn't it? Yeah, we were very lucky with that because again, uh, we didn't know. We we went labyrinth. Oh, cool! It was a great success. Let's do Dark Crystal, and then. Henson, you know, just after we we you know a couple of months after we we strike the license with them. The, we saw the trailer for uh, for Age of Resistance, uh, the the prequel uh, on Netflix, and we were like, "What is this?" And it was funny to tell them, it was "Like you didn't tell us about this." We're like, well, we couldn't tell you. About this. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that's cool. And, and I mean, funnily enough, uh, just recently they announced the Pacific Rim animated series on Netflix coming up next year as well, which is like, we didn't know about that either. <laughs> which is like, good, yes, lucky. And uh, so am I, am I right in that you also did original photography for the Highlander board game? Because so, there's obviously you go way beyond what the actual movie uh, provides as far as imagery. Sorry. Sorry, what do you mean photography? In the, of the actual cards of the Highlander, there are scenes and characters that are, oh. seem unique. Ah, yes, yes, yes. No, we haven't shot those pictures, but we have used stock images that are right free, right free stock images. That obviously, we, that meant going through giant archives of pictures and picking the right pictures, then checking that they are right free, so they are, you're, you're, you're not publishing other people's yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. That's copyright. Or in a few cases where there was a copyright, we went and talked, for example, the people that make the swords. We took pictures of their props, their swords, and asked them for permission to use it and, uh, and published them with their permission and credit them to give them the, the credits for the thing so it's a bit of advertising for them which is actually another interesting thing uh, when you do um license product <laughs> like highlander like my little pony uh, sometimes you go out to get to toy fair conventions etc and you show your license stuff and uh, people go there and go ah yes you've had one of those my little pony games and they were like 
No, we haven't made one of those. By the way, it's it's. it's see the Hasbro seem, see the Hasbro logo here. It, no, <laughs> so it's funny how you know other people go. You mean you? This is officially licensed. Like, yes. <laughs> so yeah, there is a little bit of that. Uh, people going, this is for real. Like yeah, yeah, it is for real. <laughs> Right. Oh, that's very interesting. Interesting. And yes. just out onto the chat, if you do have any questions for Alessio, please do put them in. And, uh, and or for relay. Caesar, indeed. And or yes, for Caesar. Well, this is it. Super Sarah is going absolutely nuts over Caesar's uh, illustrations in the in the side screen. There, <laughs> she's absolutely loving the uh, the cuteness of all these monkeys. <laughs> well, that kind of leads us into crowdfunder, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, she's freaking out a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> now, so is is that that monkey there? Is it actually blowing a harmonica or some sort of musical instrument? Because this is what Sarah has been trying to push for. A what? Melodica. A melodica. Is that a thing? <laughs> okay. A melodica. Is it type of a harmonica? That's it. Yeah, we think, believe so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Snowyak is asking, will you release an expansion for the Dark Crystal game? That is the plan. <clears throat> of course, A, we want to see what's happening with Age of Resistance before we decide exactly what to do. So uh, well, at the moment, we're, we're, we're about to release the Fires expansion for Labyrinth. And there's another couple of uh, products under Hanson license that uh, we're going to probably well we are going to launch next year we haven't announced them yet so ooh, secrets uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah the the expansion for dark crystal is in the pipeline we have sculpted uh, garthim soldiers uh, but uh, at the moment that's on standby we want to wait for age of resistance before we decide what to do obviously <laughs> because like, let's see what, what's up with that and we can we don't know uh, Hanson, because of the netflix license they cannot tell us so we'll have to effectively watch and wait and see it <laughs> at the same time as everybody else. Of us, yes, yes. Yeah. I guess that, that moves on nicely to what will be your, is, is it potentially your first game of next year, Crowdfunder? Well, we haven't decided exactly when to launch it yet. Uh, there are rumors about the 1st of April, but I think that may be a joke. <laughs> I'm quite sure. Um, so, yeah, sometime next year, to be decided, to be determined, uh, we we went, we went for this idea that has been in the has been there for for a long time i mean since i started doing crowdfunding uh since the very very beginning <clears throat> the the locker uh, the cards games of locker which again is a very cute little card game with a fantastic artwork uh from uh, ralph horsley uh, the the idea was crowdfunding i always you know as a game designer as a gamer and a game designer i always felt that crowdfunding was a bit like a game <laughs> like a giant game with high stakes uh, with rules things you do things you don't and strategies and tactics and cool moves and bad moves and uh, so and a certain element of randomness in it and a lot of and then through the years he developed into also a culture a, a, a set of stereotypes there's the trolls there's the, the super backers so there's all this culture that grew around it so uh, I, I went you know this idea that i had for a while let, let's do it let's do it let's do a crowdfunded game about crowdfunding so basically looks at the process of crowdfunding kind of has a it's fun we, we make a fun game which is not you know it's a card game it's a small thing it's for fun it's not a uber strategy game with miniatures but uh it's it's funny to play it's also in a way informational for people that want to get into the whole world of crowdfunding because i mean the, the principles are sound it does tell you i mean the five suits that you collect are effectively the five elements that you need for a, for a crowdfunding campaign uh so the, it recreates what the crowdfunding campaign is but it does in a it does it in a not in a serious way it does it in a tongue-in-cheek way so that's why we went for caesar's great uh, fun style of, of cartoon and uh, comics and uh we went for all possible stereotypes, all possible in jokes, all possible, you know, continuously repeated things that all crowdfunding campaigns happen. You know, the oh my god, we did this wrong. Oh my god, we launched it too soon, too too late. Oh, somebody else brought up a very similar idea. So, all of those things, all of those little 
kind of stereotypical things that happen with crowdfunding, uh, we try to capture them. <clears throat> the beautiful thing about this is that, for example, the projects, the project project cards, uh, if you want to show a couple of project cards. So those are, some of them are recognizable jokes about some existing thing. Some of them are more obscure, less obscure. You know, if the audience wants to take part and, uh, and send us suggestions for them, we'll be happy to, you know, consider suggestions and bring them to life. You know, we can okay. make, uh, but not only new projects, but also uh, we thought that artists that are uh, normally working in the industry may want to do as a little friendly sketch of a card for for you know for, for advertising themselves you know showing the making a joke about crowdfunding and uh, at the same time putting their name in it uh, and the same for companies uh, influencers i mean like like yourselves for example uh, you know we thought a <laughs> monkeys with fire card would be cool um so uh, we're basically bringing in as many people as they want to be involved and uh, sort of make it a bit of a hey I'm part of this culture of fun and crowdfunding. You know, the the guys of uh, you know, on tabletop are, are in this. So there's a lot of, I mean, <clears throat> famous artist John Kovalich is doing as a card, and uh, there's you know Karl Kopinski. We have uh, Scott Johnson. We have lots of lots of you know people that have worked or are working on uh, in the industry are are you know, pitching in for a bit of fun. So, I mean, yeah. it does. It sounds fantastic. Uh, so yes, let's um, get that out to the chat. So chat, if you have any ideas for a project that could be included, put them into the chat right now. Uh, and do these need to be specific to the sort of games industry? No, not at all. Not at all. We have, uh, you know, the the wackiest thing there's a uh, kind of a battle station to destroy planets there's the what what is what's on the camera there is the cool box <laughs> yes so any anything at all really it could be a potato salad i mean uh, as if i think we do have the potato salad there don't we <clears throat> indeed so you know <laughs> anything anything at all it, it, this is about crowdfunding in general of course we'll have a spin on on gaming and gaminess because that's what we are but you know it, it's not a strict rule at all in fact i, I you know hasten to to add there are no strict rules this crowdfunding game about crowdfunding crowdfunded game about crowdfunding is going to be weird and wacky we're not gonna you know we're not gonna be serious about this in any way shape or form this is all gonna be a bit weird, a bit fun, a bit tongue in cheek. So you know, let's let's have some fun okay, for a change. So don't, don't take it too seriously. Manda suggesting a cauliflower shaped like a sheep <laughs> as a project or as a some other type of card. We 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 will wait and find out. <laughs> but at this moment, in time, sure. it is a cauliflower yes, sometimes as a sheep. It could be a stretch goal, you know, stretch goal to a to a cauliflower shaped sheep or a, or an add-on buy separately. Yeah, yeah. Manda's not even sure herself. <laughs> you you asked for weird and wonderful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so can you maybe give us a quick overview of how the game actually plays then? Absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> um, the players uh, have a hand of cards, uh, six cards. So imagine we are sitting around the table, each one of us has six cards. Uh, these cards are made of uh, five, there's, there's a mix of five different type of suits, if you want, or colors. So there's the uh, green cards are pledges, the red cards are buzz cards, uh, the purple ones are video cards, stretch gold cards are blue, and uh, yellow are add-ons. So these five elements, uh, video, pledges, stretch goals, add-ons, and buds, by which I mean, you know, marketing, online, advertising, all of that, are the five elements you need to make a project. So each player has a hand of those. Uh, there's a, you also have a project. Uh, so you, you've chosen a project which has a certain level. So for example, if you're making the combustible cat project, you need 10, uh, 10, euros, dollars, whatever it is the, the currency that you want. So you say, let's say dollars, you need $10. <clears throat> uh, with the cards, uh, you um, <clears throat> you pick from the central uh, deck of cards where the, um, basically the, all these, there's a, the, there's a central deck and you pick from there, you draw from the deck and uh, you try to make a suit of five different cards. So you want, basically to launch a campaign, you need a pledge, 
a scratch goal, an add-on, a video, and a bat. So you need the five different cards in your hand. Uh, you have six cards, so you have flexibility, and you also have update cards, which are like wild special rule cards that you know change the change the game as a, give you special abilities. You know, stealing cards from the enemy, the enemy, sorry, the, the opponent, the other players, um, <laughs> and so. Uh, what basically the cards go around you draw you discard you draw you discard you pick cards from the other from the other players you look at cards you force people to do things so as eventually one of us will have the five different suits they need and the cards all, all have a different value some are good cards some are bad cards you could have a bad video card and but a great stretch goal card so eventually when you think you're ready you have all the five and you have enough to satisfy the the requirement of your project you go launch and slam your project down on the base. You launch it in the in the world. When somebody launches, everybody else can launch, even if they don't have the the, the complete thing. Because if, that means like if somebody is launching a good, a big, well planned Kickstarter, then everybody else could also maybe hurry up and launch and uh, maybe a not quite so finished not quite so polished campaign so everybody launches when one launches everybody is free to go and there's uh, audience cards lying on the on the table next to the uh, next to the draw card draw, draw uh, deck and then basically people can just go and grab these audience cards and you, there's there's a mad dash at grabbing the, the right cards and uh, they're face down you see them face up and then they are face down so you you have to remember more or less where the good ones are and so you're you're trying to grab the audience you're you're grabbing the audience literally after launching and uh, eventually the value of your of your project plus your audience together must come and fund your project. If you succeed, your project is funded. If you fail, your project is not funded. And the game continues with a new hand. <clears throat> you keep doing hands like this, uh, rounds like this, until uh, you have a certain level of uh, amount of projects or uh, amount of value of projects, depending if, if you're playing the simple rules or the advanced rules. But yeah, so that roughly, in a nutshell, is, is the game. Right. So yes, it, it's a quick, fun, easy to learn style of game, it sounds. Indeed, we wanted to keep it simple. Uh, the the rules are very, very, very brief. Uh, we wanted to keep frantic, quick, uh, as in and not long. Uh, it doesn't even fast playing, but also it doesn't last very long. Uh, you can make it last longer, of course, because you can set the amount of uh, successes effectively you need to win. So you can manipulate how long it lasts. But it's uh, it's certainly designed to be you know uh, quite quick and definitely fun not not a serious thing it's full of jokes it's full of in jokes it's full of uh, irony and um it's kind of it's, it's kind of inviting us to take it to take the world of crowdfunding which often is very serious very dramatic into you know a bit more relaxed yes yes i mean certainly i've had a look through the cards of the uh sort of the prototype version i have here and yes i've had a good chuckle at some of the projects uh um, but uh, in the uh, good fun so snow Yak's suggesting for a card um undelivered reward or a delay <laughs> seen that before so one thing that we did sort of think of and i know that caesar's doing an awesome awesome amount of illustrations here <laughs> on the page this is great to look at um we were kind of thinking along the lines of when the actual card is created to try and have a bit of a nod towards one of our viewers. So the way to do this is to essentially run a little competition. So if the chat were to type on in exclamation crowdfunder, and that is with a K, then they will be entered into the competition and we will draw then a winner and that person's Twitch tag will get included or entered into the card into some description. We'll work it out, but you will be part of the card. Sounds fun. <laughs> and that is the spirit. That is the spirit we're doing all of this in. It's, you know, we don't take this too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, he's an artist. He doesn't need to know how to write things. <laughs> okay, well, okay. Before, um, 
<laughs> Before we draw to a close as well, I think I'm, I'm sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. Sure. Um, there was one thing that I really would like to point out is that uh, if you check our um, newsletter, our website, and subscribe to our newsletter, um, <clears throat> if you go on the Riverhorse, www.riverhorse.eu website, and uh, what we're going to do as part of our newsletter or on social media as well at the end of the uh, at the end of the week for Christmas, because it's Christmas, we're gonna release a print and play version trial version of Crowdfunder. So this will be rules, cards, and so people can just read the rules and give us feedback on the rules, or ideally even you know print all the cards and try it out, play it out over the, over the Christmas holidays, and uh, you know so maybe in the new year people could have gone, all right, I tried this, I played it, you know a bit more, a bit more, like more, a bit more of this, a bit more of that. How about an idea for this card, you know, either an update, wacky card or a project card, you know, so. If you, yeah, if you basically just <clears throat> either get a newsletter, subscribe to our newsletter, ideally, or uh, go on social media, Facebook, River Horse, uh, find us. We'll, uh, we'll sure there will be ways of getting the, the print and play uh, version of the of the Crowdfunder game for playtesting. It's a playtest version. It's not, it's not the final version, of course, but uh, it's in development. But, you know, you could help us with the development and have some fun in the process. Excellent. That sounds amazing. So there you go, guys. Um... If you type in exclamation River Horse Games, that will give you the link to River Horse's main website. And then there will be links for the social media from there that you'll be able to uh, get involved. And yes, absolutely, get your input into a game that is going to be coming out sometime next year. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alessio. Thank you uh, again to Caesar. Thank you to the guys in the, uh, the background who have been helping out today uh, to make it all possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome. Uh, and of course, uh, for all of you, have a wonderful Christmas. And you. All right. Okay, then. I'll let you <laughs> sign off then. Take care. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. And I will see you tomorrow evening. But until then, bye-bye for now.